Pali word, banya, is usually translated as wisdom. And it's one of the qualities we're trying to develop as we follow the path. Wisdom may not be the best translation. For one reason, there's a verb, pachanati. That's when we chant just now. Ye du kang na pachanati. And the other reason is that banya is a quality that we all have to some extent. And a lot of us are not very wise. Remember when I would have problems in meditation? I would go to John Fu and ask him about it. He'd say, well, use your banya. One day I said to him, well, I don't have any banya. That's why I'm here meditating. He looked at me and said, I come from the other side of the world, which, of course, I had. But then he went on to say, everybody has some, some banya, otherwise you wouldn't be a human being. So I went back to think about it. Finally came to the conclusion that what he was talking about was discernment. And as I checked it against the various texts, places where bhajanati is used as a verb, discernment fits very well. You discern something, something that was hard to see or too subtle to see before, but now you have the discernment to see it. You see distinctions. This is a lot of what discernment is, or banya is. One of the standard definitions is seeing arising and passing away. On one level, that's very common. We see things arising and passing away. There's the sound of the crickets, there's the arising of the breath, the passing away of the breath. The arising of the feeling, the passing away of the feeling. And it's seeing these things in particular that we want to learn to do skillfully. And ultimately, of course, we want to see the arising and passing away of suffering, stress. so that we can understand how it arises, how it passes away. If you don't see the arising and passing away, you can't see the factors that go into causing it. When you can't see the factors that cause it, you can't let them go. And this arising and passing away is happening all the time. It's right here. So the question is learning how to discern it. How do we do that? How do we see something that's been right next to us all the time, but we've been overlooking. The text recognizes three sources for discernment. first one is listening. We might say three types of discernment. There's the discernment that comes from listening, which in our day and age would also include reading Dharma books. The second is the discernment that comes from thinking things through, pondering them over. And then finally, there's the discernment that comes from developing. It's through listening and reading that we get the basic ideas, what the practice is all about. And thinking them through is when we begin to see how it makes sense. But the real discernment that actually makes all the difference is the one that comes from developing. What do you develop? The Buddha lists five strengths. Strength of conviction, strength of persistence, strength of mindfulness, strength of concentration, and the strength of discernment. And he explains them in such a way to show that the first four lead to the fifth. And so if you're looking at ways of how to develop discernment, you look at well, how do you develop conviction, how do you develop persistence, mindfulness, concentration, and how do these things contribute? to giving rise to discernment.
first there's the strength of conviction. Which is conviction in the awakening of the Buddha. That this was an important event that makes all the difference in the world. The fact that someone, through his own efforts, was able to find true happiness. And he was able to do that not because he was some special divine being, but because he developed qualities of mind. As he once said, Inside arose, light arose, as it happens in one who is ardent, resolute, and heedful. So it wasn't because he was some great being who just naturally had these insights. Is that anyone, that's the implication, is anyone who's ardent, resolute, and heedful can develop these same qualities. So you think about that, what means what that means for you. True happiness is possible if you work at it. And this gives rise to discernment in the sense that you take the arising and passing of suffering seriously. You take your actions seriously. And you take that possibility for true happiness seriously. So that when your desire for immediate entertainment comes in and says, I don't know about this, then you turn and look at that desire for immediate entertainment and say, well, I don't know about this either. Where does this really go? Because consciously or not, we're always mapping our lives and the lives of other people. We've seen somebody out there whose life seemed to be a good life. And we've been mapping our lives on that. Sometimes it's seeing other people having fun. We'd like to have fun the way they do. Seeing people excel at a particular skill, we'd like to excel the way they do. Because it looks like a good way to live. It looks like we would be happy doing that ourselves. And so what the principle of conviction is asking us is we take the Buddha as our map, or the Buddha's life as our map. That's a suggestion of what is possible for a human being to do. And as we develop this discernment, this is one of the topics of recollection, we can reflect on this. If you get tired of the breath, you can reflect on the Buddha and his awakening. Now it's not just a story coming in from the past. It's not just a myth or an archetype. It's an actual example of how a human being can live, what a human being is capable of. That right there gives rise to the discernment of one, what's a worthwhile goal, and two, what's involved in finding two happiness. Get your priorities straight. As you develop conviction in this way, it should give rise to persistence, the willingness to put more effort into it. We're not here to practice simply at a leisurely rate or what feels comfortable to us. We have to stretch ourselves, put more effort into it than we may like. Because if you just go along at your normal casual rate, it doesn't force you to discern new things that you didn't see before. The issue then becomes, how can you put in more effort and yet not get strung out? How can you give yourself encouragement to 
keep going, even when the results are not immediate. This requires ingenuity. It requires an understanding of how you can get the most results the most efficiently. Because that effort here doesn't mean just pure exertion. It means skillful effort. Having a sense of how much effort is too much, how much is too little. No, but what kind of effort is involved? What times do you have to work, say, at a particular unskillful quality? And what times do you simply watch it to see it fade away? This is not simply the case that every defilement is going to fade away simply by being mindful of it or noting it. We're trying to burn it away. Defilements don't get burned away. They get understood, and that's when they that's when you get past them. And sometimes you can understand a particular defilement, a particular case of greed or aversion or delusion, simply by watching it. See, oh, this is how it comes, this is how it goes. And because you've never watched it before, the ability to observe that can cut through what you hadn't noticed before. Other times, though, the defilements are not that easy to deal with. They're more tenacious, and you have to exert more effort. You have to change the way you breathe, you have to change the way you think about it, the way you perceive it. Or you think about the situation that gives rise to the defilement or perceive that situation. That requires a more active figuring out. And then there's some defilements that you can't uproot right now, so you simply have to learn how to put them aside. At least cut their strength down so you've got room in your mind so you can actually practice. So that's another type of discernment that develops from putting effort into it. It's learning how to live with the knowledge you've got some unfinished business. You're not repressing the defilement. In other words, you're not denying that it's there. You're suppressing it. You're trying to put it aside for the time being. And now you learn how to live with the fact that you've got these goals that you haven't attained yet, but you're going to work on them. That's a lot of discernment right there. So as you apply the strength of persistence, you develop a lot of discernment in beginning to distinguish what's skillful and unskillful, what particular type of effort is needed, whether it's an active one or a more passive one, what the particular problem you have is one that trying to comprehend the stress or noticing the cause so you can abandon it, or what you can do to develop good qualities in the mind. In the sense of right time and place. Underlying all this is your ability to generate desire to do this. And this is where you learn how to psych yourself out. How do you encourage yourself? How do you get yourself interested? Sometimes you can read the teachings of some of the Ajahns who give a lot of encouragement. What do you think of their example? The Buddha gives three ways of psyching yourself out. One is thinking about how much you really would like to not be suffering anymore. It's called putting yourself first. Another is thinking about the excellence of the Dharma. It's really hard to find a teaching like this, and here's your chance. You found it, you can work with it. You have its guidance available. It may not be there all the time. It's called putting the Dharma first. The third one is an, is an interesting one. It's called putting the world first, and what it means is Realizing that there are some people out there who can read minds. They can read your mind. You are supposed to be meditating. What are you doing? 
Are you really meditating? You're all dithering around with something else. You'd rather show them that you're actually serious about what you're doing. That can apply not only to the meditation, but also to your daily life. You want to present a good example to other people. It's called putting the world first. So see which one of those motivations works at any one time. You may find that one may work today and another one may work tomorrow. Or you may find that you've got to find other ways of encouraging yourself. But this is an awful important part of using persistence as a means of developing discernment. Learning how to talk yourself into doing the things that you know will lead to long-term welfare and happiness, even though you may not like doing them right now. And how to talk yourself out of doing the things that you'd like to do right now, but you know they're not going to lead to very long-term happiness. That's an important part of discernment right there. And the way you develop it is just putting in the effort putting in the effort, and then you find yourself getting strung out, you've got to find some way of giving yourself more energy. Fine-tuning the effort so that it's really effective. The strength of mindfulness builds on that, because you realize you've got to keep this quest in mind all the time. As you begin to see, if you forget it, start wandering off into other things. And it's very easy to get back into old mental states that are not all that productive. Why? Because simply you forgot what you were here for. This is one of the features of process of what's called becoming. We create these different worlds in the mind. And it's amazing how quickly one world can get dropped and another one can get created. And while you're in that particular world, you may find yourself in a world in which there's no reference to the Buddha's awakening at all. No reference to the practice at all. And if you're not mindful, you start indulging in that particular world. And the whole process of the path just gets dropped. A huge gap, and it doesn't develop the kind of momentum that it should. Because that's another aspect of persistence and mindfulness, is that you stick with it consistently and you begin to see things in the mind that you didn't see before. A lot of the mind's subterfuges lie in the gaps. As John Lee once said, there comes a point where the mind just passes out and suddenly finds itself in a different world. And what happened in the moment of passing out, you don't know. Because what you're really doing is you're hiding these things from yourself. It's like what happens in a play. You're trying to create the illusion so that you're a parlor in pre-revolutionary Russia. It doesn't help to see them making the set, putting or the actors putting on the makeup. They want you to get the impression immediately, so that everything just gets done behind the curtain. The set gets put up, the, actor, the actors go out and come back in, and as the curtain rises, there you are, pre-revolutionary Russia. And the mind does the same sort of thing, it hides things behind curtains the way it constructs these little worlds. Because if you could see yourself constructing the world, you'd see all the ignorance and other unskillful qualities that go into constructing the world. And you wouldn't believe it. But the mind, part of the mind wants you to believe it, wants you to go off into that world. So in order to fight that tendency, you've got to be consistently mindful. When you are mindful, you begin to see these processes as they happen. This is another way in which mindfulness develops discernment.
And then the fourth quality, of course, is concentration. This concentration basically is developed mindfulness. It's able to stay with one frame of reference really consistently. Whether it's the body or whatever topic you find congenial. The Buddha doesn't force everybody to stick with the breath all the time. In fact, he has other topics of meditation. When the breath gets boring, you can think about the different parts of the body, you can think about the virtues of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. You can think about death if you find yourself getting lazy or complacent. There are a wide variety of things that you can use as a topic of concentration. There's a sad story about a young monk who was in Thailand. Went to see one of the famous Ajahns and asked him, well, what technique am I going to use? Or what technique is going to work in getting my mind to settle down? And the Ajahn basically said, I don't know. And the monk thought, well, the Ajahn doesn't know anything, so he left. What the Ajahn was saying specifically is, you have to find what topic is congenial to you. Nine cases out of ten, the breath is the best topic, and it's by, f by far the safest topic. It's always good to have that as part of your arsenal. Because some of the other topics can get you off in strange states of mind, and you need a good place to come back to to re reestablish your alertness, reestablish your sense of well-being. Of what technique you're going to need at any particular time, you have to use your own discernment to see what's working with your mind. This is how concentration develops discernment, or one of the ways in which it develops discernment. So as you learn how to observe your own mind, what's going to work, what can you settle down with? And in the course of settling down, as in the case of mindfulness, as you try to keep the mind with its one object, you're going to start seeing the things that pull it off. You didn't have this one focal point to keep yourself oriented. You wouldn't be able to see the movements of the mind. It's like that image John Lee gives of the post planted at the edge of the sea. If the post stays in one place, you can put a ruler on the post or a measuring stick and see exactly how far the water's come up, how low the water's gone down. And the measurements will be relevant because you've stayed in one place. If you keep moving the post around, moving it back off the shore, moving it out into the ocean, then the measurements you take are going to be meaningless because you don't have a single standard of reference. So if you really, really want to see a rising and passing away in the mind, you've got to get the mind as still as possible. The more blatant movements of the mind settle down, and then you can start seeing the really subtle ones. And this is where discernment comes in. So it's in this way that you develop discernment using those four qualities, the four strengths, conviction, persistence, mindfulness, and concentration. All of them make it easier for different facets of discernment to arise, because all of them require a certain amount of discernment just to get going. And as discernment gets stronger, as the Buddha said, it strengthens these qualities. So they help each other. The image the Buddha gives is of a a roof, or the substructure for the roof. You've got all the rafters, and you can't really get the ridge pole up there until you've got some supporting rafters. And as the rafters go up, they're not really solid. They're solid only when they get nailed to the ridge pole. So in the same way, the discernment you get from these four, four strengths helps contribute to the arising of really strong discernment, and then the strong discernment strengthens these other strengths, makes them more solid and reliable. So 
you're looking for ways to develop discernment, try developing these other qualities. Try to be as observant as possible as you do this. At the same time, being honest with yourself about what's going on. Buddha once said, one who is honest and no deceiver. And I'll teach that person the Dharma. Those are his requisites. That's the prerequisites for anyone who's going to practice. If you're not honest with yourself, you, you'll you start denying things that are arising and passing away in the mind. Of course, if you're not observant, it all goes right past you. This means that the Dharma is something special. The discernment of the Dharma is something special. It's not simply something you can figure out by reading books and being clever. It requires good qualities of the heart. This quality of honesty, which is basic to all the other qualities, all the other good qualities you need. So make sure that honesty enters into the mix as well. That's how discernment becomes penetrating, as the Buddha says, leading to the right ending of suffering and stress. <laughs>